Welcome everybody to our next Be Nimble series uh, broadcast. Uh, today we have a fun one. We have public art for the public good. And, and with us today we have Lauren Ross uh, from Laumeyer Sculpture Garden and Scott Stewart from Millennium Park uh, joining Dion Brown and myself. We're really excited to have these, these two guests here. And I've got to admit to, to everyone, this is one of the first calls or webinars that I've really felt this this topic is probably a little bit out of my depth. Um, you know, I, I think you're you're going beyond our, my own comfort levels here. My my dad growing up, he worked for American Greetings for 30 years, and and I've worked with museums and and parks for the last 15 or 20 years, and. I, we always say, you know, we can't draw you a stick figure for the life of us, but we could probably tell you what it's worth. Um, and so, so I'm really excited for you guys to enlighten our, our audience, but also myself here. Uh, for those of you that are tuned in today, if you don't know, Dr. Scott Stewart is head of the Millennium Park Foundation, has been there for five years, I think, about now in that role. I got to know Scott taking a trip up to tour the park at five years ago now, it's hard to believe, and have maintained contact. And I think, I like to think at least a friendship has grown between the two of us. Hopefully he reciprocates that feeling. <laughs> but we're really excited, Scott's really, his background is horticulture. And one of the things that he said the other day that really resonated with me is curating gardens as versus landscaping a garden and, and thinking of every inch of a park or grounds as, as really an artwork. And it really resonated well with me. We used to say a lot at the arch, you know, the arch was a canvas for St. Louis. We needed St. Louis to paint the picture. And so when he said that about curating gardens, it really, really hit home. And Lauren Ross, executive director of Laumeyer Sculpture Park. I've also known Lauren for several years now, although maybe not quite as, as well as Scott. Lauren came to St. Louis maybe three or four years ago. Does that sound? Uh, two and a half. Two and a half. Okay. I'm mm -hmm. giving you more credit for, for owning this city. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, I'm willing to round up here, but it, coming from a lot of um, pretty incredible cultural institutions across the country. I mean, Institute for Contemporary Art in Richmond, Philbrook Museum in Tulsa, the High Line in New York, which obviously has a lot of merit and and really is is held in such high esteem around the world mm -hmm. and across a lot of project spaces um, white columns new york and then i mean you've done so many great things it's it's really exciting to have both of you join us today um, and i i promise I, I won't stroke your egos the whole time i'll, I'll keep you in check a little bit here and uh and jump into kind of why we're here today and you know one of the things that, that we talked a little bit about, but I, I think is a great start and basis to this conversation is how do you measure the impact of public art? And so I, I, I didn't want to start with anything too easy for you. I wanted to challenge you from the start. No, that, that's not an easy question. Um, I, I mean, I think, um, I, Scott, if you don't mind, I'll, I'll, I'll okay. kind of yeah. jump in. Yeah. I, <laughs> I think, you know, it's, it's a very important question, but also a difficult one. And, um, you know, measure, anytime you talk about measurements, um, right, immediately you're sort of in the realm of, of you know, quantitative things. Um, and I think, you know, when I think about art, I think, um, and culture, I think a lot of, and, and parts, I think a lot about qualitative things. So, so it's, it's difficult, I, I, I think, you know, the impact of public art can be really can be great um, and and broad reaching and so you know public art um, I think makes our our communal spaces more interesting more lively more human um, it can you know connect spaces to to the his, to history to culture um, and and bring people together I mean I think it's you know it can be a great beacon for for social gathering and activity. Um, and perhaps there's no better example of that than, than the Anish Kapoor piece in, in Millennium Park. 
um, you know, and, 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 you know, also I think can, can really spark a lot of civic pride. And I think, again, the, the Kapoor is a perfect example of, you know, here's the, this piece that has now become sort of synonymous with Chicago. Um, but how you measure all of those things is, is really difficult. And I think, you know, in, in the museum field, very often when we measure impact, we're actually looking at K through 12 kids because it's just easier to measure impact with those kids because, you know, they're, they're always being tested and they're learning so quickly and, and they're developing so quickly that you can see that development, you know, over a very short amount of time. It's more difficult with, with adults. Um, and it's much more difficult in an uncontrolled environment like like mm -hmm. public space where you may not even have a total handle on who's coming and going at, at any given time. Um, so I, I, for us, I mean, we I think we rely a lot on feedback on, on visitor feedback and and, you know, people telling us um, you know, how, how something made them feel or what kind of experience they had. And so there's certainly times when it feels more anecdotal than scientific, but um, it is, I think, um, it is an important approach um, than, you know, something that's purely data-driven or, or, or clinical. Yeah, Lauren, I absolutely echo that exact, um, that exact sentiment that it's, it's, it's difficult, certainly, to, to measure impact. I mean, first, you have to define what your impact for a particular piece or a particular citywide collection or a park-wide collection might be. And I mean, we could go down the rabbit hole of that kind of evaluative component, um, you know, for, for, for weeks at a time, I think we could go down that rabbit hole. But mm -hmm. I, I think, you know, yeah, moving aside from those pure quantitative sort of how many people come to see this exhibition or uh, partake in this activity where, you know, for example, the Using your CloudGate example, um, you know, the CloudGate used as a backdrop for some other performance. Uh, how many people attend? You know, you know, is that impact? Is it not? You know, uh, you know we, we could go either way. Um, I know one thing that we have been playing with here at Millennium Park is uh, within our Boeing galleries, our outdoor exhibition spaces. Um, the artists that have created pieces for that are currently on. Um, we have been um, we have been working with the School of the Art Institute uh, and basically working with some of their students in some of the um, in some of their studio management courses. And they, those students, have been developing programming and curatorial processes and so on and so forth for for those Boeing Gallery exhibitions. And so one way we've been trying to begin measuring impact is less about the pieces themselves sort of directly, but more about, you know, that programming those students are developing. Who is it reaching? How is it reaching them? What impact is it having? Uh, you know, it's sort of, I, I know, again, that's sort of uh, that's, uh, a little bit sort of secondary to a direct measurement. Um, but yeah, we're, we're trying to kind of measure those those components, those ideas are of, you know, sort of activating the public art pieces themselves, right. um, which has been really, which has been valuable for a lot of our stakeholders and, and such. Yeah. Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, I think that's, that's absolutely crucial. I mean, putting, putting work out there is, is one thing and has tremendous value, but by activating it with public programming and educational mm -hmm. programming, not only is it easier to to measure your impact, but I think those things deepen the impact. Um, so you know, in, in really substantial ways. Yeah. Obviously, nothing you've put out there, whether it's the Bean in Chicago or any of the great pieces at Laumeier, you know, none of that's free of charge, free free to you to to install it, right? I mean, that comes at a cost, and so you know, as it, as you try to measure impact, I mean, one of those things that has to be considered always is when you're talking to a funder, you know, they don't want to hear that you're spending a million dollars and you're going to get 12 people to show up. Right. <laughs> right. You know, very hard to make that fundraising pitch. But so, you know, some measurement of impact has to be, you know, judged. And, and obviously you guys touched on it both there where you, you talked about visitors and the number of visitors and and Lauren, I loved what you said of the K through 12, because to me, 
anything you do for me is nice. Anything you do for my children goes well beyond. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I, I, I always, that, that resonates personally as much as professionally with me because I do think there is something that needs to be done more on those K through 12 op opportunities. So yeah, kudos to that one. <laughs> uh, you know, and I, I think one of the things that I, I also was thinking about as you were talking about it is the Highline actually, when we went and met with the Highline, just like I went and met with Scott at one point, they were talking about the economic impact that the Highline makes on the surrounding area and how they capture that back. Um, and so it was related to basically, um, no one ever wants to call it taxes related to the, uh, the impact around them, but that's effectively what it is. What, you know, whether it's some form of TIF or what, whatever it might be, um, you know, what are some of those ways that you guys are seeing yourselves, you know, use the impact that you're making to support your spaces? Mm -hmm. Well, Lauren, if you don't mind, I'll just, I'll jump in, you know, Millennium Park, this is a bit of, Eric knows me, this is a bit of a softball for me. I, I, I like this economic impact stuff. So, uh, but, uh, so thanks, Eric. No, yeah. um, you don't get a PhD without putting some numbers behind it. <laughs> exactly. I love, I love the quantitative aspects of the economic impact pieces. And, and you're, you're absolutely right. I mean, Millennium Park um, as a whole, has a, you know, obviously a very significant economic impact on its surrounding neighborhood as well as across the city of Chicago. Uh, and really, I mean, I think a case could be made regionally as well or statewide as well. Um, you know, and we certainly track those, that economic impact, um, both um, sort of on a year to year basis, uh, you know, doing lots of, lots of sort of in the park surveys and, and, and visitor feedback pieces about, um, less about revenue generation in the park, it really is more about sort of within the central business district. Uh, what, um, you know, did they, you know, before coming to the park to get their selfie with CloudGate, did they uh, visit a restaurant? Did they visit a bar? Did they visit a shop? Are they going to one of those uh, after work? Are they staying at a hotel downtown or you know, so on and so forth? Um, so those are, you know, those are obviously all good you know, good quantitative measures of, of, of economic impact. You know, one thing, particularly on the fundraising front, though, that we have been finding really valuable is talking less about, you know, economic impact, and, but, and more about the cultural economy that Millennium Park generates. You know, what does that cultural economy look like? And yes, a component of that economy is, is all of the, the facts and figures about tax dollars generated from sales tax and direct spending and the property values in the, in the area and so on and so forth. But a, a bigger and what we're finding for those donors who are interested in supporting particularly public art installations, public art uh, activities in Millennium Park, what those donors that seem to be more interested in is the, the sort of um, cultural capital that's being generated. So, you know, an exhibition is going into Millennium Park or a program that supports an exhibition is going to happen. Um, how, is that act, how is that activity going to develop cultural capital and economic opportunity beyond the borders of Millennium Park? You know, uh, is the art, does the artist represent a certain neighborhood in Millennium Park, you know, or in Chicago? Uh, does the artist, you know, identify with a particular demographic of Chicago? And, you know, is there an opportunity or how would we extend the, <clears throat> the impact, both culturally, you know, cultural learning, but then also economic opportunity to those demographics, to those neighborhoods? Um, and it's been a, that's been a really valuable conversation with our donors. Um, it's easier to talk about than do sometimes. That's a, that's a bit of the challenge, uh, but we've, we've started to wade into those waters as well. Um, so we're, we're seeing definitely this sort of balance between, you know, everybody loves the, the numbers of the economic impact, but sort of discussing this cultural economy and the economic opportunity that comes with it and what role does the park or individual installations or exhibitions play 
that's becoming very, very critical, both from a fundraising standpoint, also, but also in just our relationship with the city of Chicago and, and the sort of greater, greater region in Northern Illinois. And I, I should note real quick, sorry to, to jump in, Lauren, um, to any of our attendees, please feel free to use the chat or the Q&A feature if you have questions specific to your own interests that you'd like, like the guests to address. So I don't mean to uh, cut you off, Lauren. I just uh, also, I realized I didn't say that at the beginning of the show. No, it's it's fine, no problem. I, I I completely agree with everything Scott said. I think I think both of those approaches are equally important, and and certainly in terms of fundraising, I, I think you know there's a certain set of donors that respond more to the economic message, which often is you know really useful when you're dealing with government, for example. <laughs> um, but another set of funders who I, I think respond more to um, that sort of you know argument that that these spaces create um you know help with things like cultural competency and um and that is often the case with private foundations for for example so you know it depends on what their what their mission is um it's uh you know and then there there are impacts like you know um you know the the value of, of real estate. Um, you know how the presence of a park can affect real estate, and, and I have to say, in terms of the development of the High Line, right, that was a huge, huge factor because the High Line went through what was the last undeveloped part of Manhattan, which is the, the Hudson Yards, which now is completely unrecognizable from what it looked like a decade ago. Um, but um, yeah, and and, and so we. Um, Laumeyer, like the High Line, and like like many places, are public-private partnerships, and so you know we we do get um, um, Laumeyer is owned and under the jurisdiction of the St. Louis County Parks Department, and so you know we get government funding that way. Um, but I think I think it it also creates somewhat of a challenge for us sometimes with messaging to our visitors. Um, right, the park is always free. There's never admission. Um, but to, to the point you made earlier, Eric, right, it's not free for us to present what we present. So um, you know, and and numbers are really important. And the, like the more people who come, the better in many ways. But that doesn't mean we're necessarily making more money if more people are are on site. Um, so it creates, a, I think, a challenging in terms of messaging to people who who might. You know, very well feel like, well, I'm already my tax dollars are already supporting this. So, you know, why should I become a member or why should I give more? And, um, you know, that it's it's a half truth because, you know, yes, their tax dollars are helping to support um, park maintenance, for example, but um, but that money is not funding the, you know, the art collection or the the gallery that we're running or, you know, the majority of the educational programming that, that we're doing. So, um, so I think, you know, there's, there's a, a, both an opportunity and challenge there to kind of message that to people. And sometimes, you know, depending on who you're talking to, targeting, targeted messaging can be important. Yeah. So moving aside from the numbers, which is obviously the part of this conversation, I understand, you know, how do you go about selecting kind of, uh, Scott, you started to touch on it with that cultural capital, or, you know, how do you go about selecting what artwork should be, you know, a part of your your organizations and a part of the, the parks that, that you represent or, I mean, or if you're just out advocating for it in the neighborhood, you know, what, what kind of factors do you take in and, and what type of decision-making process do you kind of put into ensure that the public artwork is truly representing the public. Yeah. Lauren, do you want to speak first? <laughs> <laughs> that, that is also a difficult and complicated question. And, and it, right, it's handled different, differently in different places. I, I think, you know, um, at Laumeyer, it's definitely a curated program. Um, so, you know, we do have a full-time curator on staff who um, I, under my guidance, um, now, I mean, I, I'm relatively new. She's actually been our Laumeyer's curator for close to a decade now, um, but she makes um, the majority or really drives the majority of, of the decisions as essentially our artistic director. Um, you know, so we don't necessarily go through the same process that some public spaces may have to go through in terms of, of you know, a very slong, 
a, a very long, slow, laborious process of having to go in front of community boards. And, you know, I, I mean, it's, you know, where it's sort of curation by committee, which um, is, is, is difficult because you can never please everyone all the time. So, um, so we do take almost more of a museum approach to it um, in, in terms of, of having a, a curated program. Um, I, I'm, I'm interested, even though we've got this, you know, 105 acre campus, I'm really interested in us um, doing more projects off campus. And I think in that case, we need to really, we might have to be a little more um, thoughtful and careful and, and maybe, you know, take a slower approach um, depending upon the spaces where we're working to make sure that we are uh, representing the, the community. Um, and I will say that temporary public art is much more forgiving than anything permanent. Um, in fact, the, you know, the longer I'm in the field, the, the less permanent public art makes sense to me. <laughs> um, because, you know, you just, you just can't predict the future. And, and obviously we've seen a real reckoning in, in recent years of, you know, um, you know, a shift in social mores where, you know, pieces that, you know, seemed acceptable a hundred years ago no longer are so. And so, you know, um, um, we, you know, I, I, let's say temporary is, is, is much more forgiving and, and in some ways I think more interesting, right? Because it can be more timely and responsive. Yeah, I second the temporary uh, component. Yes, um, that's obviously like for a place like Millennium Park where you know, really the park itself is the art in a lot of ways. Uh, we have those feature elements, Cloudgate, Crown Fountain, um, Jay Pritzker Pavilion, so on and so forth. But a lot of ways, those themselves are there. They're, we call them, refer to them uh, as our permanent collection, but they they are also the park itself. The, the identities are so tightly wound together. Um, you know, the temporary exhibitions, be them in say the Boeing galleries or occasionally we'll do a temporary exhibition in some other areas of the park. Um, you know, for example, we're, we're working on one right now for a temporary exhibition this year in, in Lurie Garden. Um, you know, it, though, that's where you know, we feel here at Millennium Park, that's where the real excitement is. And it is much more forgiving in, in, a, in a sort of a, a cultural context. It's, it's much more forgiving. Um, but we, much like Lauren and her team, we, we curate that process, really kind of cura curation by committee. Um, since we, you know, we aren't really a neighborhood park. Uh, like some of the other like Chicago Park District parks might be a neighborhood park. We aren't a neighborhood park in that traditional sense. And, and um, you know, so therefore we have some latitude when it comes to curation of, of some of the art. Uh, so we, 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 certainly, we certainly curate by committee. We rely really heavily on the excellent work of Department of Cultural Affairs and Special Events, the city agency that has responsibility, primary responsibility over Millennium Park. We rely on them very heavily in their public art program. Uh, one of the best public art programs in the country and we rely heavily on their expertise and input. Um, and we're also very lucky we have a lot of wonderful art institutions, the Art Institute of Chicago, Museum of Contemporary Art, uh, you know, so on and so forth. So we rely very heavily on their editorial staff and, and such as well. Um, to, to really guide that process. The foundation, Millennium Park pays for all of this, uh, you know, and the upkeep of the art and, and so forth. Um, but the, the, the foundation actually takes a bit of a backseat in the tutorial process. And we, we try to rely on those subject matter experts to, to guide that. Um, but I will say in, uh, in the last couple of years, that tutorial process has made, and, and Lauren sort of alluded to it in the statue or a monument of 100 years ago may or may not now be acceptable. And there's a wonderful conversation going on nationwide about that, those very topics. Mm -hmm. to, a, to a poor, to a degree, that conversation has started to enter even the art curation process for our temporary exhibitions. And, and, you know, asking questions, do we make the art installations in the Boeing galleries more local, more directly representative of Chicago? 
you know, in the past we've brought in, you know, huge national and international names and done wonderful exhibitions. Uh, they've been very well received. And uh, this latest exhibition, the two separate artists, these questions really started to begin to arise. And, um, you know, and that's where we made the decision to, to focus on Chicago artists, to focus on artists that have a high um, sort of affinity or, or, or uh, connection to specific neighborhoods in, uh, in Chicago, specific background of Chicagoans. Um, and so even to, I think to a degree that more national level conversation that's going on about, you know, the, the value of some of these long, long standing public art pieces, uh, monuments, statues and such, we're even seeing it trickle into, you know, sort of contemporary art in, you know, current decision making for the, the installations that go in here to, to Millennium Park, which has been, I think, actually very, for us at least, been very um, beneficial. It's really rounded out our thinking about the role that we have in the public art world in Chicago. Yeah. Coming from a museum background, Scott, I, I like that what you just touched on. Um, coming from a museum background, we plan out exhibitions, traveling exhibits, probably three to hopefully five years out just by getting into contracts and all. For you and Lauren, how far out do you, for temporary exhibits, how far out do you have to plan out to make sure you even get on the list and available to you? Yeah. Well, as with many things at Millennium Park, that's always a bit of a gray up for grabs. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so, so um, we, you know, we, I like to try to plan in that three to four year window, Dion, you know, sort of that traditional sort of museum style three to four year window. Um, you know, I will say, for example, the current exhibitions, those were put together and those are site specific, created, uh, commissioned site specific work. Um, that was all put together in a year and a half and installed in a year and a half. Um, you know, so, so yes. That gives you the range. Yeah. <laughs> I'll just leave that there. <laughs> yeah, same. I mean, we, we strive for two to three years out, um, which really is the best practice, you know, in terms of planning and fundraising. But um, admittedly, sometimes we, we fall short of, of that mark. Um, I'm actually co-curating an exhibition with our curator, Dana, which is taking, it's now less than a year away. And we're speaking with, with artists now. We're having sort of, you know, some of those first conversations. Um, I mean, I, <laughs> I will offer up as an excuse that COVID did throw a monkey wrench into our whole exhibition plan. So <laughs> that had a little bit to do with it, but, but yeah, we do, um, we, we, we aim for two to three years out that, that is best. Well, and Lauren, you have such a unique space because you do have an indoor component as well both... as an outdoor component. And so, you know, you you do kind of get a mixture of both so <laughs> you get maybe the good and the bad with both of those but you know there you're able to probably bring some different experiences that maybe a purely outdoor space can't bring um but you're mm -hmm. also kind of have to think through i mean more the traditional park model but also the traditional museum model at the same time and and so yeah, and it, it, it is nice to allow yourself a little room for spontaneity. Um, you know, um, I, I have I, like an artist just pitched an idea um, to us for a, a project that can be done sort of fast and, and cheap um, um, in summer, fall. And so we've just started a conversation. It wasn't in the schedule, but um, it's, it, it's, it's sort of opportunistic and spontaneous. And, and I, I think, um, it makes sense for us. So, so that's always nice to ha give yourself the flexibility to, to work some things in too. Yeah, I second that, Lauren. You know, the, the, the spontaneity aspect is, is I think really important. Um, you know, going back to one of our original conversations on, on impact, I think some of that spontaneity can have a really positive um, effect on impact of your, your exhibitions or your overall collection. Um, you know, and we're, we're lucky here at Millennium Park where um, most of the temporary exhibitions are funded through Millennium Park Foundation. 
Um, so we don't have the sort of the bureaucracy associated with uh, with a art installation. And so that allows us to be very responsive and spont and spontaneous, um, which which is which is really kind of valuable. It's stressful and can throw things off the rails real quick sometimes. But it is, I think, a, a real valuable aspect for a to really any public space collection is to be able to be spontaneous when opportunities arise. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. As, as a former executive director myself, like that was always one of the most frustrating pieces to me is I, I, I am much more probably aggressive with timelines and want to see things happen. And so, you know, when I would say, hey, let's form a partnership and let's do these things. And someone would say, great. Four years from now, this will work perfect for us. <laughs> be like, I don't even know where I'll be in four years. <laughs> so, you know, I, I think it, there's, there is a balance to it all. And, and I have to always, my wife does a good job of reminding me that I'm not always right. Um, <laughs> and so that's always uh, keeps me in, in check. But it, it is one of those things where um, finding that balance is really, really important. And uh, so, kind of away from the large scale artwork installations, but going back to the idea of curating the gardens. And obviously those large scale installations have, have a role that they play within that as well. And, and Scott, you talked a little bit last week of one of the current installations at Millennium Park, having a, a landscaping component even wound into the artwork. Yeah, yeah. So we have one of our, one of our, Exhibition. So I, I guess back up a bit. Um, you know, one of the one of the interests from the foundation, from our board, really was looking at and really always looking at how do we continue to sort of enhance the Millennium Park experience for the for the visitor, Chicagoan or visitor to the city. How do we continue to enhance and enliven Millennium Park? You know, and we're relatively built out. We have a you know we're a 24 acre campus, call it 24 acre uh, park were relatively built out, you know, each space has its designated sort of purpose, function, element. Um, and so, so bring, you know, in, I think in, you know, versus, you know, I think Lauren, you, you have a little bit more room to run, a little more room to work with and, and, and such, um, you know, so, so the idea of how, how do we bring new art and bring, um, you know, bring that into, into Millennium Park uh, something that that the foundation board's been very interested in, and so we took an approach of of looking now at the landscape of Millennium Park and saying, you know, landscape gardens, those are works of living art, and what can we be doing around the park to begin to uh, curate, develop, curate, and then in essence put on exhibition these these new gardens. Some of them are permanent gardens, some of them are temporary or seasonal gardens that are you know designed for a specific purpose or a specific season. Um, you know, and and you know that's that's been something that has been um, we've been doing this now for going on to three years, and it's something that really has taken on a life of its own for Millennium Park and people are recognizing you know we're, we're installing these gardens and they just aren't any run-of-the-mill public park garden or public park landscape there's something special there's something very dynamic there you know uh there, there's something that is that is very artful about them um we've we we talk about them even uh in terms of curating the garden. Uh, rather than you know pulling the weeds and you know uh, pruning this and that, we, we talk about it in terms of curating these spaces, uh, and then we add into it the element you know occasionally we'll drop in some temporary sculpture, some temporary installation, and so forth or, or exhibition into these spaces, which just sort of further enhances them and establishes them as as their own their own works of works of art. Uh, but that has been something that that. Um, you know, again, not being in not being a museum background or an artist or or coming from an art background myself, but coming from a, a very sort of nuts and bolts horticulture background, um, you know, I've been very excited about us making that transition here at Millennium Park and sort of, uh, you know, for me personally, it sort of gives a nice tip of the hat to the industry that there are some really talented designers that really are artists in and of themselves 
There are some really talented nursery people that are growing these plants that are in a lot of ways, technicians and artists in and of themselves, um, you know, uh, but also um, just from a overall perspective of Millennium Park, there's huge enhancement of the experience where now as you walk through the park, almost everything you're seeing and touching and smelling and, and, and hearing is a work of art in this park. So it now becomes about Millennium Park, as I said earlier, Millennium Park as a work of art that have these discrete elements stacked within. Yeah, it's, it's so interesting. It's I, how parks talk about living collections. You know, again, I'm my background's in museums. And so, you know, in museums, we, of course, are non-collecting museums, but we talk about collections all the time, the assumption that it's that it's artwork. So it's it's so interesting, this idea of, of you know, your, your living collections and your non-living collections. Um, and, I, and I think, you know, we, hybridity is really the model for, for Laumeier in many ways, right? We're a museum and a park. And so, and our, our, our mission is to engage the community with art and nature. So we're always thinking about this crossover between art and nature. And in my mind, some of the most interesting works at the park are the ones that really blur those lines. Sometimes, you know, almost to the point of being indistinguishable. We, we have a couple of examples of, of earth art projects. Um, one of my favorite pieces in the collection is by an artist named Beverly Pepper. And it's, it's an example of, of land art or earth art. And it's this absolutely incredible, really beautiful space that's, you know, it's like a giant sort of mound with a staircase where you can go up to the top and walk around the rim, sort of like a crater shaped space. Um, and it really sort of, you know, blurs that line in very interesting ways. We, there's another piece in the collection by an artist named Ian Fim in Finland Hamilton, Finlay Hamilton, sorry. Um, and the piece is actually four trees that are just, you know, clustered together. And, and I think you'd actually have to be a really observant person to even notice that it's, it's an artwork. Um, but that's, that's, I think, where some of the most interesting um, things happen is, is in, in blurring that line. Um, and, and, you know, for us, the, the maintenance, it, it also breaks down to sort of an interesting ways in terms of our partnership, right? Because the county parks takes care of the lawn and, and the trees and we take care of the art. And sometimes, I mean, we literally have these conversations where we're looking at something and like, all right, so, you know, which category does this fall into? And, and, sometimes, and sometimes we have to collaborate on, on, on care and maintenance on those pieces because that's what makes sense. So you bring up an interesting topic and, you know, one that you, you talk a little bit about, Laumeier is a mixture of a museum and a park. And if we think of like the traditional art museum where everything is don't touch to a typical park where everything is, yeah, you go put your hands on the tree or walk through this area, you know, public art finds a middle ground a lot of times, right? And that like, you kind of got to accept that it's going to get touched, but <laughs> yeah. it, especially when you have a six-year-old and an eight-year-old like I do. Um, <laughs> sorry, Lauren, probably touched a lot of the things <laughs> in uh, Laumeier. Um, but, you know, what are, how, what's your thought process then on, on how you engage public art? Because obviously the more hands-on it can be, the more interactive it can be, does have an impact it does have i mean we all learn through all of our senses not just by sight or not just by sound and so the more senses we can engage with something obviously the the more impact it can have the more lasting impression it can yeah and i think the public love i mean people love interactive pieces right i mean it's you you're you're right in that kind of environment it's very very hard to to say to someone you know, don't, don't touch, don't climb. Um, you know, it's a constant challenge for us because, you know, as stewards of this collection, we want to keep it in the best possible condition so that it's still around for future generations and, you know, touching and climbing and kicking and punching, which I've also seen <laughs> bizarrely. Um, you know, not my kids for the record. <laughs> well, it's mostly teenage boys, actually. <laughs> 
Um, but you know, yeah, sometimes people interact, you know, or, um, you know, letting their dogs relieve themselves on the sculpture, which is something we see a lot too. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's very hard to, to, um, I mean, people, people come to a park and they want to, you know, they want to run and play and, and, uh, you know, sometimes we see with the, in the, the indoor gallery too, that after, you know, kids have been just, you know, cutting loose outside in the park to then have to come inside and, and, you know, switch to like, you know, museum behavior is very difficult. Um, so I, I think it's, it's a challenge. We've, we've tried to roll out sort of interaction guidelines because some pieces are more um, interactive than others. And so, you know, some have, you know, please look, but don't touch and others, you know, people are allowed to touch and sometimes it only adds to the confusion. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, it's an, it's an ongoing challenge. I think, you know, we feel said equal, it's equally important for us to steward the work and to give our visitors a, 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 a fun and rewarding and fulfilling experience without making them feel like they're being, you know, policed or scolded. So it's, it's hard. It's, we're always kind of trying to find the right balance. Yeah. yeah balance. That's, that's a good, that's a good, a, a good way to put it. Um, Yes, we, I mean, as you might imagine, we face the same, same issues that, that you and your team do, Lauren, uh, here in Millennium Park. Um, you know, I, I think one of the, the, I mean, everybody wants to touch CloudGate and such. That's a, that's kind of a no brainer, but I think one of the more interesting uh, stories about that is, and sort of the evolution of, you know, how do we, how do we let the public interact with the public art or in some respects, their art, um, you know, um, is, is crown is actually crown fountain. Um, you know, the space, Jomi Plinza really envisioned the space as a bit of a, a contemplative space as a bit of a quieter space um, that draws some distinction between the relatively busy busyness of, cause it's right there at, at Michigan Avenue. And, the busyness of Michigan Avenue, and then the sort of contemplative fountain, uh, you know, his sort of uh, contemporary uh, take on fountain. And obviously, if anyone has ever seen a picture of Crown Fountain or been to Chicago and been to Millennium Park and seen a Crown Fountain, it is anything but quiet and contemplative. Uh, you know, particularly during the warm season, the water is on. It's, um, for lack of a better way of putting it, it has become a outdoor water park. For, for kids and actually a bit of a, a bit of a rite of passage of Chicago kids to, you know, you know, sort of go and play in Crown Fountain. Um, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's evolved that way, and of course not directed by anyone, um, you know, and, and yeah, there were, you know, there's a point at which you have to have these sort of internal conversations about, well, do we lean into this and just sort of let it go? Do we push back against this and, and such? Um, you know, here at Millennium Park, sort of our standing guidance on that really is, you know, the, the park was meant to be experienced and not to be um, what we think of or what is often thought of as a stereotypical, Eric, as, as you sort of alluded to, you know, traditional museum where, you know, there's the artworks are presented behind a piece of glass or behind a little rope or, or something and there is simply, you know, do not touch, you know, sort of signs on place. Millennium Park part of the original philosophy, the vision of the park was to be a place that was fully interactive in that way. So, you know, uh, Cloudgate was meant to be played. Mm -hmm. um, Crown Fountain, even though it wasn't meant to be played in, um, as people sort of showed that that's what they wanted to do, you know, Plinza was very much on board, loved it. You know, where else can you, where else can you go and quite literally become a physical part of um, a Jaume Plinza sculpture, you know, um, you know, that's, that's pretty cool. Um, people do it and they don't even know it. Uh, but it's still, a, it, yeah, it is a bit of a balance because, you know, uh, I have yet Lauren to see teenage boys punching, picking things, but I, I can only imagine it. I can imagine that to be the case. Uh, you know, yes, lots of climbers and lots of, uh, you know, that kind of stuff, certainly, but, um, but yeah, it is a it is a sort of a tenuous balance sometimes because you want you know you want people to experience the art, but at the same time, um, there's a protection of the physical integrity of of the pieces. Yeah. 
You know, and I also, I don't want to suggest that, you know, the public um, is, is, you know, fully, if that, that's the biggest danger to, to the well-being of the sculpture, uh, because it's also just being outdoors. I mean, you know, again, we are a museum and Lahmeyer is actually accredited by the AAM, the, the Alliance of Art Museums, which sets national standards for things like collections care. And so, you know, as an accredited institution, we actually have to follow their guidelines on collections care, but most museum collections are in highly controlled environments, right? Where it's, you know, climate, temperature, humidity control and high security. And, you know, those objects are only handled by, by professionals in a very controlled way. Um, you know, our, our collection sits outdoors, you know, 24 seven, 365 and is subjected to extremes of hot and cold over the course of the year and and all kinds of weather events and wild animals and birds and insects <laughs> and so you know it's it's sort of funny again you know trying to find that balance between okay you know we want to maintain all the highest you know standards of professional practice and yet we're working in an environment that's anything but controlled so yeah no it, exactly yeah same you know we you know weather is probably our biggest um i hate to say it it's an enemy but it's our, our biggest challenge yeah. when it comes to maintaining the the artwork it's mm -hmm. you know people are great and yeah people can cause issues but people generally enjoy the pieces um but yeah the weather is actually the biggest biggest obstacle biggest challenge we have yeah 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 scott and lauren um with covid Post-COVID, we're getting into post-COVID and activating that outdoor space. For instance, I believe, Scott, you said you have a music series. Mm -hmm. how, how does that affect the attendance, you know, your even thought process of assigning, you know, going after a group and who curates those for you? Yeah, that's that's a great question. And if, if you know, if, if you, if anybody has ideas, I'm open. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> because... Uh, you know, we're, 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 we're facing the same, those same, those same challenges, Dion, you know, like, like the idea of, you know, for our live events, which we consider part of our public art exhibition sort of series in a lot of ways for our live events, you know, how, how do we do this now in a COVID world, um, you know, post COVID, whatever you want to call it, um, you know, how do we do this? You know, obviously there's the, the easy to follow sort of rules and regulations when the city says you can only have this percentage capacity, um, everybody has to be distanced in this way. And so those are, those are the easy ones, relatively speaking, to, to address. Um, one of the things that I'm most curious about and, and have been really sort of beating the drum of in these conversations is um, building public confidence again to, to come and enjoy these performances, to come and enjoy Millennium Park, to come and enjoy the, the art exhibitions that we have, the gardens that we have and such. Um, and, you know, that's, you know, both on sort of the local Chicagoan level, but then also on the tourism level as well. Um, you know, we, we were closed for quite a while uh, in 2020 from about uh, March to June, pub closed to the public. It was all part of the Chicago's um, Chicago's sort of lockdown uh, rules and regulations. But, uh, <clears throat> you know, since we've been open, um, we've seen, you know, not nearly the number of visitors through. Um, we've seen, you know, um, you know, yeah, visitation and such has been down. But interestingly, from Chicagoans, a lot of questions about and a lot of want for those live events to come back. Right. You know, and it's sort of like, you know, how, how do we do it? Yeah, we, we don't have the, the answer right now. We have four or five plans, uh, you know, that, that we're going to pick from, you know, what, when the, you know, when, when we determine and say July 1st, we want to, uh, you know, begin live events. Uh, well, where's the July 1st plan? We'll, 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 you know, implement that one. Um, you know, unfortunately that's where we're at. Um, you know, uh, you know, I, and yeah, I, I don't, I don't learn and forgive my ignorance here. I don't know if you all have live events and, and such as well, but. We, yeah, I mean, um, so we closed just for three weeks. Uh, mm -hmm. Lamar was closed in um, March of last year for, for three weeks and then, and then reopened. And that was the entire county park system. 
Um, however, our indoor um, space where we have the visitor center and gallery that was closed for 11 months. So we actually just reopened it in, in February. Um, and it's and it's reopened with all kinds of capacity limitations. Actually, it's only open two days a week, and um, we're not at you know we're following local um, guidelines on how many people can be in the building, and we're doing temperature taking, and even have a a, um, a log, a visitor log, in case we ever need to do contact tracing. Um, but um, but the outdoor spaces has been open and, and I think, you know, many parks have actually seen an, an uptick in, in visitorship um, to the outdoor spaces during this time. I mean, I, th I think, you know, those of us who have outdoor space have been at a, a, a huge advantage in terms of what we've been able to offer over the last year. I, I really feel for my peers in the performing arts sphere. It's just um, been, you know, I think a pretty devastating time for them. Um, we, we do events and programs and, and classes and, and a lot of what we do is outdoors. So many of our regular events and programs had to be either, you know, canceled or, um, or altered. Um, so, you know, uh, the biggest event we do every year actually is uh, mo on Mother's Day weekend, we do a big art fair. And this has been running for this this year would have been year 34. Um, and last year we had to, to you know, we can get 15,000 people at this event. I mean, it's a weekend long event, but it's it, it attracts huge numbers. So obviously we couldn't do that. So last year the event was held online and we had to make the call um, earlier this month about whether or not we would be doing it. Uh, we'll be doing it again online this year because, you know, I, we're easing back slowly, gradually, and safely into, into gatherings again. So, you know, we're going to start with some, some much smaller gatherings, you know, keeping, and again, just, you know, following whatever the local regulations are on, on capacity. Um, it's, it's a little unusual. Some of the, the um, local mandates on, on capacity limits apply equally to indoor and outdoor spaces, which I, doesn't totally make sense to me, but, but there you have it. Um, so, you know, we're, we're, we're doing what we can. And, and I, I mean, I have to say like, even just to hear you, all of us using the term post COVID makes me very happy and gives me a, a huge amount of, of, of hope. You know, I, I really do feel like we're starting to, to, you know, enter into that era. And um, certainly a lot of, a lot of polls and surveys that were done last year um, by, by national organizations about when people would feel, feel comfortable returning to cultural spaces and public spaces, you know, very often the majority of people would say, you know, I'll be comfortable when there's a vaccine. So it's, it's really wonderful to, to now be entering that that phase of this whole um of this whole COVID era of of you know a return to to whatever the new normal is yeah you know a couple of geniuses in st louis created uh blues at the arts and it was one of our <laughs> those were smart guys <laughs> i mean they are do. <laughs> but, but it was a very well attended eric did they have blues at the arts last year they did it virtually Virtually, no, not live. Yep, yeah. It was awesome, awesome, and uh, it has such momentum. Um, it's just interesting to see how those live events continue on. Yeah, afterwards. yeah. I mean, it's it's incredible, and and you know, obviously, there's different types of of things that can be done more. Like some are more spontaneous and can be done more last minute than than others. Like you know, like booking bands. You know. Um, but, you know, like I said, some of my colleagues who, who work in, in things like opera, you know, which takes years to develop, right? I mean, and, 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 you know, think of all the sets and costumes and rehearsals and cast and career, you know, that they can't just be spontaneously thrown together. So, um, you know, we've, uh, some of our outdoor offerings, we've, we've, partnered um, at times with, with local places that just, you know, to do sort of um, smaller, lighter, more COVID friendly versions of, of what they do. So the St. Louis Symphony Orchestra actually, um, and you know, their Powell Hall where they, they normally perform has been, has been closed for some time. Um, they did a series of, of sort of outdoor free community concerts um, around, around town last year. And, and one of them was, was at Laumeyer. Um, so, 
you know, and even that we had to, we couldn't just open up to the public. We had to control the number of people who were there and, and you know, do socially distant seating in the grass and things like that. So, you know, I, I think every, every the, the whole, the last year has been all about trying to find workarounds. <laughs> Scott, you look like you were about to say. Something. Oh yeah, I, I was say yeah. We 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 one of the one of the components of sort of bringing bringing some culture arts and culture activity back to Millennium Park was, you know, we're we're trying, I guess you'd call it like a lo-fi approach to uh, to things where um, you know we're we're going to have um, you know it, it initially it sounds a little strange or or maybe even a little ridiculous but uh you know it you know roving roving per performers you know um pop-up symphonies with four or five performers um you know these sort of um and really it's more pop-up a little bit more spontaneous obviously we're, we're planning them but uh a little bit more spontaneous appearing um but things we're also not advertising heavily we're not marketing heavily. We may have, uh, you know, just like the day before a couple of social media posts about, you know, hey, this is going to be happening at, you know, noon uh, at CloudGate or this, you know, whatever. Um, you know, we're, we're starting to play around with those. And, and part of it is simply just to bring some of that, that life back to the park. Um, but then also part of it is a, a bit of a test to begin seeing, you know, you know, I, I spoke of that sort of public confidence piece earlier, but then also just how will people? Um, how will people react to you know being able to take these things in once again? Uh, it's been better part of a year and a half or so since since anybody's really seen a live concert in Chicago. So let's put on a little miniature live concert with you know four or five symphony uh, performers, symphony musicians. See what kind of happens. We're still faced with all of the same thing, you know security and logistics and you know we, we gotta you know we can't let we we can't let a bunch of people crowd the space you know so we're so we're, we're interested to see how that works out but um but taking these smaller steps uh we're really hoping uh from the public confidence standpoint it really really begins to build that um yeah yeah need the uh the field of dreams test if you build it they will come you know it's is not quite proven out after COVID, and we all kind of need to to see it, and and hopefully they don't all come at the same time. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. I mean, that's that that's you know we've we've had sort of funny internal conversations with the staff where it's this combination of excitement and anxiety. You know, it's like if we do an event, we really want everyone to come, but oh no, what if everyone comes? You know, yeah. <laughs> so. Yeah. And, and, and of course, there's a huge variation in people's comfort levels, right? So, I, you know, there have been people who I think probably would have come to a big event at any point, and there are others who are like, uh, whoa, it's, it's too soon, it's too soon. So, you know, that's, that also makes um, planning and, and the predicting part difficult. Yeah, I, I will say one thing, it's, it's sort of um, pushed a conversation internally for us is that idea that you know moving forward just as a permanent function of everything that we do um any live performance is is, is got to be in essence simulcast or live streamed or whatever you want you know and and we would do that previously with select performances you know maybe a main stage performance for blues fest or something like that but um um but now it's it really is become you know uh, almost a requirement uh, desire of of the, the the audience to to have that, uh, which presents its own interesting challenges because there's the whole technology component and you know are you really set up for this and you know that's a whole other crew that's a whole other you know yeah all all of these other things um, in a in a time and all of that costs money and in a time where it's public anybody that has public funding any space that has public funding is watching funding very closely. Mm -hmm. So we have a couple minutes left. Any parting thoughts that you would like to share related to public artwork and everything going on in the world today? <laughs> uh, I think that's the hardest question, Eric. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think you've stumped me. I haven't narrowed it down enough to give you a... <laughs> it's 
space to talk about. Well, I, I, I will say just, you know, and I don't know if this is a parting thought or not, but, you know, having, um, having been uh, basically an outsider to the public art, art world, uh, coming into it and beginning to learn to work with artists and work with curators and such, I have to say the public art world um, has been one of the most exciting, um, genuine, and really welcoming group of people uh, that I've ever had a chance to interact with. Uh, it's just been a, it's just been a really wonderful experience for me, learning to operate in this public art world. And you know, now I'm you know, yes, public art. We need more and more often of it. So yeah, <laughs> yeah, and I think you know. For me, again, sort of different background coming to it more from the, the museum side and, and you, um, you know, my introduction into presenting artwork in public space um, has, has very much, I think, changed the way that I've, I've thought about the, the role that, that art can play in public life. I think for, for many, many years, artists have been wanting to kind of break away from, from you know, what's seen as, as you know, a rarefied or elitist realm for art and, and you know, have direct impact in, in people's everyday lives. Um, but it's, it's more difficult than it sounds and it's, and it's challenging. Um, I, I think, you know, because my background really is rooted in um, very artist centric spaces, including, you know, alternative art spaces that were, you know, founded by artists. Um, you know, I, I, of course I think about the public and our audience, but I also think about the artists who we're serving and, and what we do in, in terms of, you know, commissioning new work or, or, you know, giving them an opportunity to present or an opportunity to reach a, a different audience and sometimes larger, but definitely a, a, a different audience that they might reach in an art gallery or, or a museum. So I, I think that's a really, really exciting part of, of, of what we do as, as well. And I find tremendously rewarding. Maybe this should have been my last question for you, Scott, because it would have been maybe easier to answer, but any new pieces coming for either of your parks that, that we should get excited about? Not all showing up at the same time, but excited to come <laughs> see it at an appropriate time. Yeah, well, well, you know, we have, we have our, our two exhibitions, uh, Christine Tarkowski and, and Edra Soto in our Boeing galleries, and they were to be deinstalled this spring, uh, but, you know, COVID and, and such, they're actually staying through 2023 now. Um, so those are, those are still very exciting. And um, yeah, we've got a couple of things in the work. Uh, we alluded to one in Lurie Garden and, you know, a couple of others in the, in the park. Not ready to open the doors to the public on that one quite yet, though. Yeah. So we we are, you know, um, because so much of what we do is outdoors. It's you know, um, again, a, a lot of the the works. Some of the things we're presenting now are actually postponed. They were supposed to be presented last year, but got pushed to this year. But. Um, we, as I mentioned in February, we reopened our indoor gallery and we currently have a group exhibition um, entitled The Future is Present, which is a, a selection of artists who are addressing climate change in, in their work. And it's, I think, a really fantastic exhibition and you know, an important exhibition. We integrated a lot of educational components about climate change into the gallery. Um, so, you know, sort of interspersed between these artworks or um, information about um, climate change issues and what people can do in their own lives to, to help, um, you know, um, stem the, <laughs> um, the, some of the issues um, around climate change globally uh, and locally. Um, and um, this, later this year, we have, uh, we'll be bringing in we launched a visiting artist in residence program in 2020. Again, the timing turned out to be awful, but um, this year's visiting artist in, in residence uh, is an artist named Aida Sayevich. She's um, based in New York, but uh, originally from Bosnia. And um, she and her family actually fled Bosnia as refugees when she was a teenager. And her work um, for many, many years now has been you know, addressing the um, attempted genocide of, of Bosnians. Mm -hmm. um, and it was really, I'm very excited to bring her to St. Louis because St. Louis has one of actually the largest Bosnian population outside of Bosnia. 
um, um, I think it's about 70,000 people strong in, in the metro area, which is really remarkable. So she's she's coming in and not only showing work um, in, in the gallery, but also doing a lot of community outreach. Um, we've um, sort of paired her with a local community organizer uh, to, to literally have conversations with the Bosnian diaspora here, which I think will inform future work for, for her. So, um, so we're, we're really excited about that. And, um, you know, it's, it's a heavy topic, but I think her approach to it is really um, appropriate for our audience. And uh, really her approach is about, you know, how do you memorialize atrocities in, in ways that um, aren't, um, completely off-putting or terrifying and and can be read universally even though they're about these very specific um, moments in history so I, I think it's it's a great um, example of how art can be challenging and accessible at the same time so we're, we're really excited about that we are a few minutes over Dion any quick parting thoughts you gotta unmute if you want to give them <laughs> <laughs> No, he's not going to unmute for us. I think what he meant to say was thank you, Lauren. Thank you, Scott, for joining us today. It's been a really fun and informative conversation. And I'm sure everyone listening got a lot out of this, as I know Dion and I both did as well. So thank you so much. Thank uh, you for the invitation. Thank you. Thank you for having us here. Yeah, wonderful. Yeah. Well, thanks. Have a great day. You okay. too. Take care. <laughs>